Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are somewhere in the Pacific, out of Leyte in the Philippines, charting a course of south by southeast. When out of the deep of the sea, a new volcano is born, and your ship is caught in the middle of it, from which there is no escape. Listen now as Escape brings you Vincent McHugh's story, The Boiling Sea. It should have been an easy trip. It was the spring of 45. The war was almost over, and what few Japs were left that far south didn't figure to give us any trouble. I was first mate of the Hopi Victory, hauling cargo with the landings in the Philippines. But this trip, we detoured south to the tiling island of Karazuruti in the Moluccas to pick up a detachment of rangers, a demolition team, and bring them up to Samar. We cleared for the north about 1830 hours, and as darkness fell, I went out on deck. There, I found Lieutenant Drury, the ranger CO, and his top sergeant watching Gam Kamura, the volcano over on the island. Hi, McAllen. Evening, mate. Quite a sight, isn't it? Sure it is, but it'll get better. We passed closer to it off to Nadi. In the dark, you can see the lava spouting like 4th of July. We got to look at a small one back on Kazaruti, inactive. This whole group of islands on both sides of the strait is volcanic, you tell me. That's right. Now you can have my share of them. That big baby there used to keep us awake nights rumbling. Well, they aren't exactly conducive to peace of mind, I'll admit, Sergeant, but they're very interesting. I'd like a chance to study one more closely. No, not for me, Lieutenant. Well, probably won't get another chance now. The men all comfortable, Sergeant? Well, I... It ain't the Queen Mary, sir, but they're okay. Sorry, this baby wasn't meant for troop transport. No matter, we're used to improvising. Well, night, gentlemen. Night, night sir. Night, Nice guy. The best. One of them guys with principles. Serious. You know, educated. Them kind usually get clobbered first thing. But he's come through. Plenty. You have a time back there in Casaruni? No, not much. Jap radio station. Half starved out already. Of course, they put up a fight. They always do. But not so bad. Hey, look at that thing. Belching smoke a mile high. Flashing like... Yeah. yeah. Spectacular, all right. Hey, uh, Lieutenant, could I, uh... Could I interest you in a human scalp tanned with mangrove bark? Got me a couple of extra back there. Sell one cheap. Oh, no, thanks, Sergeant. I got one scalp. I hope that'll last me the run. That night, for the first time since we left home, I couldn't get to sleep. I tried reading a while and gave that up, too. Finally, I got a cup of coffee and took one up to Hannigan on the bridge. Hey, thanks, Mac. Just what I needed. We sipped our coffee quietly. The bosun stood silently at the wheel. The time was over 425 hours. We were steaming up through the Maluka Passage. Of course, one degree true, speed 18 knots. A smooth, gentle swell. The phosphorescence in the bow wash was bright enough to show our hands and faces. It was peaceful. Hey, Mac. Hey, Mac, you smell anything? Coffee. Now, come here. Stand over here. Yeah, a little sulfur and something that smells like wet dust. That's what I thought, too, sir. Well, couldn't it... Say, isn't there a volcano over there in Halmahera where you might be getting a little land breeze? Yeah, but we passed it an hour back. I'll take it. I got him. 
You guys spitting over the side up there? <laughs> What's the matter, Brown? I just happened to notice my intake water's heating up. How much? Well, it's supposed to be about 25 degrees centigrade around here. It's 29 now. We're pulling sludge, too. Looks like pumice. Okay. Guess you better call the captain, Hannigan. Smell that, Captain? Yes. You checked the ship, Mr. McCallum? Yes, sir. Boyd and Foreman went over it, too. Nothing wrong. Yes, well, stop the engines. Yes, sir. Mr. Hannigan, you check our position? Yes, Captain. It's verified here on the chart. Sonic depth finder on, Mr. Grangeen? Yes, sir. Turned it on right away. Reads 1143 fathoms. Hmm. Now, see here. This is where we are, about 35 miles west of Gambaki and Halmahira. Nautical miles, that is. Yes, sir. Now, over here, you see, less than three miles northwest, you've got a Vigia. Hmm. Somebody reported a shoal there once. Hasn't been found again since. Might be anywhere in the general vicinity. You see here? Mark 18 fathoms. E.D. Existence doubtful. Reported February 1871. Well, if there is something there, it can't be anything but a submarine mountain. That well as depths all around it. Yes, probably volcanic. One of those buggers that push up, you know, and sink back down again. Got some of them up in the bonies. But all we've got to go on is this old captain that came through here in 1871. Probably a whaler. Didn't care where he was, so long as he had his foot on a fish. You think he could have got his bearings in Helma here? Can't tell, I suppose. Now, here's this old fella dawdling through here in February. Northwest monsoon at its height. Fairly good winds, mostly north or west to north. Current sets about two knots of the wind, so if he's out in his reckoning, you see, it's probably because he's farther over to the south and east than he thought. Like this. Mm-hmm. That puts us pretty close to the trouble. We can't go up to the southeast because we don't know how far out he was. If he was out. Now, here, we could go this way, but it seems foolish to backtrack on our course and then go west to get clear. Don't see why we wouldn't be safe if we cut across the angle to the southwest. Mm, sounds right to me, Captain. Yes, sir, should be safe enough. Well, let's hope so. Mr. Grand Jean, stand by the depth finder and sing out if you're getting any shoaling. Yes, sir. The ship was at dawn GQ where the engines stopped. The near ocean silence hung over everything. It was still dark, but a soft glimmer was beginning to show behind the peaks on Halma Hill. Start the engines. Half speed. Yes, sir. Half speed. The returning pulse of the engines, like a reviving heartbeat, seemed to bring the ship back to life. You were about 225. 225. The high victory began to gather way, turning. The bosun got her around, met her, and settled on course. Haddigan stood by the bridge farm. For minutes, we stood quietly watching and waiting. Now there was a rosy smear in the east behind us, a gloaming on the sea. I could just make out the bow and a man silhouetted in the crow's nest above it. Haddigan. Right, Browning. Engine room says 32 degrees centigrade, Captain. Up three degrees? Yeah. Stay on the phone, Mr. Hannigan. Report any change. Another few minutes, we'll be able to see a little more. Captain, man in the crow's nest, he's waving. Captain, the tometer reads 38 fathoms. Rock dead ahead. Full left rudder. Full left rudder. We could see it now, not 500 yards ahead. Nothing in a nightmare had ever been so awful as that jagged, rocky crest hunching and lifting like the back of a great dawn lizard in the yellow light. It came fuming out of the sea, slimy with the first mud of creation. The slow swell pitched up on it. We could feel its deep, grumbling roar through the noise of the engines. The ship was turning now. No one spoke. We stared with slow understanding of the horror that began to form in all our minds. The monster was not a single peak. The ridge we'd seen coming up in the southwest was extending itself in a long curve of points and benches all across the south. Keep her turning. Keep her turning. But it was already too late. Clear across the red-pink wash of dawn, a black spur joined onto the east. And when we looked north, the swell was looking up on a jag of new rock that thickened to the west and hooked on down into the southwest. The Hopi victory was completely encircled. We were trapped in the middle of an emerging volcano. The 
You are listening to The Boiling Sea, tonight's presentation of Escape. Keep the family intact this holiday weekend by driving safely. Observe speed laws, stay on your side of the road, and don't try to save time at the risk of losing a lifetime. Driving's more relaxed, more fun that way, and safer, too. And now back to Escape and the second act of The Boiling Sea. seconds for the full impact of the situation to hit us. Encircled, trapped in a crater of jagged rising peaks on every quarter of the compass. Still, nobody said anything until Captain Hazard spoke in a quiet voice. All right, stop the engine. Then we all know. The wash dropped away and the Hopi victory settled, floating dead in a fuming black-brown lake that bubbles like mud coming to a boil. The terrible, stony rumbling jarred up through the soles of our shoes. Well, I got you fellas into this. Oh, no, Captain, you did the best you could. How could anyone know where an uncharted mountain would come up out of the sea? Anakin. I don't want to get you fellas too excited up there, but you better quit smoking. We're getting 68 degrees centigrade on this thing. Got any eggs in one boiled? What is going on up there? Brownie, we're in a volcano. Well, I always told you something like this would happen. You know, you gotta watch where you're going. 68 degrees centigrade, sir. Well, Jonah made it. Yeah, we don't know. Maybe there's a hole in it somewhere. Yeah. We can wait till it settles down, get the boats out. Yes, by golly. Maybe an idea, Mr. McCallum. If we do a good job of surveying, maybe they'll forgive us for getting into it in the first place. No one mentioned the chance that we might never get out. We lived in the crater of a mountain in eruption. It was still working and thrusting, but its force had begun to die down. In the west and southwest, its highest peaks were maybe 50, 60 feet above the sea. In the north and northwest, much lower, we could see the swell breaking over it in places. Mr. Hannigan, you will check and recheck the position? Yes, Captain. Mr. Grand Jean, you will take bearings and measurements of the rim, starting at zero degrees and working all around the compass. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. McCallum, you will pass the word that we're going to try getting out of here just as soon as the first shock is over. Don't want them to think we're not doing anything. Yes, sir. Might let the people down in the engine room know, and the gun crew, and tell Lieutenant Drury and his rangers. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I carried the message to the other officers. Men were hanging over the rail, looking at the dead fish in the putrid water. Everybody was coughing. The sickly gases came up in spurts and slow blobs. Here and there, a small geyser pattered down stones and mud on the water. There was a wash of gloomy sun on the crags to the west. Beyond lay the glimmer of the Maluka Passage, like the hope of life itself. It seemed very distant now. At breakfast, the captain was still cheerful. All right, gentlemen, we may as well eat. May not have another chance for a while. Uh, what do you think, sir? Well, looks as if the first one is about over. We'll get the boats out after breakfast. See if we can't find a hole in it. Um, just a western omelet for me, mess. Uh, what if we can't do that, sir? Maybe we can find a place to get the boats across. Isn't far to Hamahira, you know, about 36 miles, but I'd hate to... Wish I knew more about how these volcanoes behave. Might sink down again in an hour or two, or it might keep building up. Could I make a suggestion, Captain Hazard? Yes, go ahead, Lieutenant uh, Drury. My boys are trained in demolition work. If we can find the right place, I think we might be able to blast a hole big enough for the ship to get through. Yes, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, we've been thinking the same thing. Only trouble is, a blast like that might set the whole business off. I suppose we'd better wait till we've tried everything else first. We take the boats out right after breakfast, sir? Yes, Mr. McCallum. You will take one and go north to the rim. Follow it to the east. Mr. Hannigan will take the other south and follow it west. Lieutenant Drury, a detail of your rangers can go in each boat. What about communication, sir? Yeah. 
Too bad we don't have radios in the boats. We'll have to use flare guns. One flare if you find a hole big enough for the ship. Confirm it with a hand lead. Then two flares to command. The usual recall signal. Yes, sir. Well, gentlemen, we're in God's hands now. Fifty yards, sir. These are in slowly, bossing right into the rocks. Yes, sir. Take a look at that water, Mac. You ever see anything like it? Slimy gas bubbling up. Not very inviting. Take a look at what's ahead, Lieutenant. Yeah. Doesn't look like any rock I've ever seen before. There's something monstrous, something tortured about it. Yeah. It's all yours, Lieutenant. Ready, Sergeant Volta? Ready, sir. Easy, Bowson. All right, hold him. Steady. Get specimens of the rock. Boto, you're going up the top and check. Yes, sir. This doesn't look very promising. No, it's only 20 feet high, but we haven't got enough explosive to blast through here. Must be gaps somewhere. There's Vota on top. Vota, can you see anything? It's about 40 feet across. And he breaks to the east. Can't tell for sure, though. All right, come back. We'll go down farther. We cruise slowly along the rim through the dirty, brown-black, simmering water, stopping every few hundred yards to break off specimens of rock. It was hot. We felt as if our bodies were drenched in a heated grease. The crater had a general downhill trend to the eastward. In the northeast sector, it came to what appeared to its lowest point. Here, the swell broke clear across the shallow peak. This is the best place for blasting we've seen yet. Yeah, it doesn't look bad. Might be possible. Let me take four of my men on those rocks and try to find some likely openings for charges, just in case. Okay. Uh, move in close again, Boston. Listen, Drury. Those rocks are wet, and that swell has plenty of power. Watch yourselves. Don't worry about us, matey. We don't mind wet feet. Uh-huh. Set her easy, Bosun. Okay, boys, over we go. Come on, get the lead out. All right, men. Spring out, look for cracks. I'll hold her off, Bosun. You stand by with the line secured, ready to toss them just in case. How about this, mate? You think we'll have to try it? Last resort. I don't know, Walt. Looks like maybe, unless Hannigan found something, we should didn't. I don't know. Blasting in this stuff is like lighting a firecracker in a dynamite factory. Well, we may have to take the chance. Yeah. Yeah, look back there toward the ship. A dirty yellow guck. We ought to break out the gas mass. We had gas mass. What was that? An explosion, sir. Underneath us. The whole thing's going up. No, no, it's sinking. Look, the men, they're sinking. From the line, Bosun, hurry him. Drury, grab the line. Get your men on it. We'll pull you in. That's it. Pass it on, all of you. Hurry. All right. They're all on. Heave. Bring them in. Heave. Fast as you can. Heave. Okay, here's Drury. Heave. Get them in. Hurry. Come on, Drury. Come on. Heave. What's happening? The whole thing's moving. Keep heaving. Motor. Where's Motor? We got him right here. Come on up. Heave. Oh, God in heaven. Keep pulling, man. Keep pulling. All right, here's the next one. Better be close to us three. Yeah. All right, coming easier now. Here's another. That's Hangley. Four. Come on, fella. Grab, huh? One more. Trouble. All right, get quick so we can get out of here. The line's coming too fast. Hey, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, trouble. Where's Trouble? Wait, Lieutenant. Stop him, Walt. Hold it, Drury. You can't. Trouble's it. still in there. You can't go back in without a line. Tie it around his waist, wall. I'm going to. All right, but tie him to that line. Then we'll be able to haul you back. We 
went over the side, disappearing into the murk and the sludgy water. The sharks were increasing in violence now. They jarred the teeth in our heads. We looked toward the ship and saw the western rim of the crater thrusting up in a great wall behind her. Then Walt's head appeared close to the boat, his face black, and he shook a hopeless no. He dived again two or three times and then let us pull him in. But Drury wouldn't give up. Come on, pull him in. He's fighting us. Well, fight him back and get him into this boat. Yes, sir. Here, I'll give you a hand. He. He. Let me go. We've got to get trouble. Let me go. You can't waste any more time. Get in. It's no use, Drury. But he's in there somewhere. We can't just let him stay there. No, no. Come on. Come on. All right, folks, take her up. McCallum. I'm sorry about trouble, Lieutenant, but he is one man. There are a hundred men back there in the hope by victory. Yeah. Sorry. It's getting worse every minute. If we're gonna do anything, we gotta do it fast. Hey, look! Over there where the rock sank. That gap's big enough for the ship. Yeah, maybe. But is it deep enough? It's gotta be. The whole thing may go up any minute like a room at ten. All right. Bosun, fire one flare. <laughs> Walt, get the hand lead. I've got it. All coiled. Don't have a drag at ten fathoms. We'll quarter across the gap. Sing out if you feel anything. The boat moved slowly across the old edge of the crater and out into the open sea. Walt, holding the lead line, shook his head at me. He felt nothing. I turned carefully in the swell and quartered back into the crater. I could see the hope by victory creeping toward us. She'd recalled Hannigan's boat and it was dragging ahead of her in a narrow S curve. They were like vessels under shell fire. The whole center of the crater was writhing with smoke and erupting geysers of mud and stone. We could see rocks falling on the deck. Behind the ship, the western crags now jutted 300 feet high, lifting and working in black agony. The ship was coming on fast. We were the last chance. Did you feel anything, Walt? Nothing. Can they make it, sir? They've got to. Fire two flares. And we'll stand out to sea and make a target for them. They better hurry. This thing's about to blow its top. All right, here too, Boston. We'll stand here. You'll never make it. That gap's too small. We're a tight squeeze. The captain's got it perfectly centered. Yeah, well, he better. It's coming full speed if he misses. Hanning it's through. Another minute, we'll know. Men, if they crash, we'll have to work fast. Unless the shock is enough to set the whole thing off. Here they come. The swell's breaking on the bow. He's not slacking speed, and it's too small. It's too small. They're in. She's coming through. She's coming through! Hey, hey, Take a chance! Yes. We're not out of this yet. Hey, he's not cutting his speed! He's, he's not gonna leave us here! Calm down! He's turning between the two boats. He'll get us on one side and Hannigan on the other. Look! Captain signaling from the bridge. Boston, give her full speed. Give her everything you got. Parallel his course. Hang past the guest walk and hang on. We'll pick you up later. You heard him. Bowtie Drury, walk. Help me get that line when it's thrown down and don't miss. Right. Here they are. Hold steady against the bow wash, Boson. Hold it alongside. All right, here comes the line. Got it. Make fast. Hurry before we lose the slack. And make it good and fast. Give it the works, Boson. Hold her in. We're fast. Brother, just in time. All right, Boson. We cut the engine. We're under tow. <laughs> Man, man. So we ain't gonna sleep on a bed of coals tonight. Brother, I ain't never felt anything so good as the pull on that line. 20 knots, full speed. Pulling us away fast. Maybe two miles already. You can't be too fast for me. Just look at that thing, will you? It's an inferno. Yeah, it's sure. Look. Look! did blow its top. Walt, help the bosun with the tiller. Hold her in. Grab the gas rod, Drury. 
Help me nod it back as far as we can. And stay down, everybody. Stay down. There's a wave coming. A tidal wave. Look at it. Come on, come on, pull. Hey, no hold. All right, get down, everybody. Keep down. We thought we were safe. 50, 60, maybe 100 feet. We'll take the whole ship. Everything. Keep down and hang on, then. Here it comes. Here it comes. Look out! Everybody all right? I, I don't know how, but we're all right, Mac. That wave had lifted us to the level of the rail of the Hopi victory. But a seismic wave does not crest an open sea, so it came as one great smooth swell that lifted us high and passed and let us swoop back down again. A few minutes later, the ship picked us up and we all paused to look back at the emblem of fire we left behind us. Well, I guess maybe the captain was right. We must have been in the hands of God. All except trouble. Yeah, all except trouble. Well, Lieutenant, you wanted to study a volcano close to. Did I? Well, remind me, Votor, to cross that study off my list. Escape. Produced and directed by David Friedkin and Morton Fine, has brought you The Boiling Sea, a story by Vincent McHugh, and adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Ted DeCorsia, Herb Butterfield, Harry Bartell, Herb Ellis, and Tony Barrett. Also heard were Jack Moyles, Clayton Post, and Jim Hayward. Your announcer, Bill Anders. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are stranded with a carnival, just this side of the Iron Curtain, when out of nowhere a fortune is within your grasp, riding a number on a roulette wheel hundreds of feet high, while at your shoulder, laughing at you, a killer clown from whom there is no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you David Friedkin and Morton Fine's story, Carnival in Vienna. Stay tuned now for Night Watch, which follows immediately over most of these stations. There's comedy with My Little Margie Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network.